This is the Sideline Slice, presented by Valentino's Pizza, the official pizza of the Huskers. Here's your host, Jessica Cootie, and Husker Radio Network analyst, Jeremiah Searles. Welcome back into another episode of the Sideline Slice, presented by Valentino's Pizza. I'm Jessica Cootie, and look who has made it back on the grid. He was off the grid hunting elk. He's back on the grid. Jeremiah Searles has returned. Welcome back, buddy. Thank you. It's good to be back. Um, I obviously didn't quite come back to the the sights and hopes that I hoped I would for a Husker victory against the Wolverines, but it's uh, good to be back. I definitely need a haircut. I look like a freaking <laughs> mountain man here, so I'm getting that trimmed up here before we head to Illinois, but good to be back. Didn't get anything, unfortunately. We got to spend eight days out in the Rocky Mountains to bugle and elk, chasing elk with my dad, so great trip overall. What happened? Why You didn't get anything? We had opportunities, you know, we were into them, but when you're hunting with a bow, you got to get them close. You know, I, if we would have had rifles in our hands, we Why all would have killed. Why didn't you use rifles? It's not rifle season. Oh. The old stick and string, you know, got to go primitive a little bit. But all I can say is thank goodness my family is not predicated on eating based off my hunting ability or we'd be <laughs> a starving household. I, when I saw you at the game on Saturday, I was like, did you get one? I, I thought for sure you'd bring one back. But okay, so here's my question then, and we'll get. Well, I promise we'll get to Husker football. We don't have to. We don't. We don't have to. We don't. We don't have to get there. Let's just let's just make this a hunting podcast okay, this week. Okay, all right, we'll, we can do that. We'll talk positive things. But I, I'm not a hunter by any means. But so tell me, you, you're there for eight days and you don't get anything. How is that enjoyable? It's so. I mean, first of all, I don't know when the last time you were able to just turn your phone off True. for like four or five days and not even worry about like. I can't get a call. Not yeah. like, am I missing a call? It's like, I physically can't get a text. I can't get a call. I have all my bases covered and truly unplug. Like, I get to do that once a year, and it is so refreshing. Like, that's a big thing. And then also getting to spend time with my dad. Like, I get to see my dad three, four times a year, right? And so getting to spend that time with him. And also, I mean, being into the elk, calling the elk, back and forth, bugling, and, like, I was into elk every day. I just didn't get a shot. Yeah. You know, so being able to just be around and hunt and active and just being back in the mountains that I missed growing up, you know, so getting back where my home state is. And, I mean, it's the same thing. I can go sit in a duck blind. I can go sit in a deer stand and not see a deer all day. But just being outside in the wilderness and stuff, it just fills my soul. How much longer till the ver man goes on those trips? Probably when he's like 10, because yeah. it's a lot of hiking. I mean, I was hiking probably anywhere from like 8 to 10 miles a day, right? Chasing elk, trying to find where they're at, moving around. So, you know, it's a lot of walking. It's a lot of early mornings, you know, 4.45 wake-ups and all that. So he's probably a few years away from going on that trip, but he's definitely come duck hunting and deer hunting with me this year. Greg and I were laughing. We were wondering if we were going to get any calls, but you weren't gone during a game, but because a couple times you've called us and like, hey, what's going on? <laughs> What's the word? Yeah. Two years, what was that, two years ago when we played Oklahoma? Yeah. I remember I hiked up to, there's a spot if you hike up to about 11,000 feet. I know there's this meadow that I can get cell service, like two bars in. And so I remember I hiked up there two years ago and I called you. I was like, hey, I need the scoop. Who's starting against Oklahoma? Do we have a chance? Like, yeah, I've done that before. But because I wasn't missing a game, yeah. um, I knew I'd be okay. didn't hear any whisper calls from you. No, I, I listened to the game on Sirius Radio, the, the Louisiana game. So I got to listen to that game, which sounded like a lot of fun. Um, and then apparently I brought the bad luck back home with me. So, <laughs> Well, okay, let's get into it. Uh, I mean, just not ideal. And we've heard the coaches, both Matt Roll, he was pretty fiery in his press conference on Monday. And then um, even Tony White today said their guys didn't come out with their hair on fire. That's on me. I mean, I think that's, that's ultimately, I think, what the staff was most disappointed in because it's what they've been trying to instill and preach since they, since they got here. And, and just didn't play their best football and and not saying that if they played their best football it would have been a different outcome is but i just i think that that was the disappointment is that they didn't come out with their a game and ready to play against the number two team in the nation yeah and i agree with that you know regardless if you're outclassed on paper or you look at that team and you go man michigan's just a better football team that's not an excuse to not come out and give them your best shot and that was kind of dis the disappointing thing for me was the lack of execution, the lack of just playing reckless, abandoned football, right? Like, you know you can't line up and go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Michigan, and I'm not taking anything away from Michigan. That's a great football team. I mean, that's a chance to go win it all type of football team if they can stay healthy. And for us to come out and not even really give them a, a punch, right? Like, so many times you saw it, like Northwestern did it to Penn State, 
I mean, Alabama's been punched by, who was that, Tulane or whoever it was, US, USF. You know, you got to come out and, and you got to throw the first punch at a juggernaut like that, right? You got to throw a punch at them and say, not today, you're getting my best fight. And I just didn't see that out of either side of the ball um, for the Huskers. I was at the game. First of all, it was hotter than could be. Yeah, Golly, for nice. end of September, <laughs> that was horrible. You know, but like that, that was just disappointing because I know what rule coaches and I know mm -hmm. what rule preach and Tony Wright preaches and Satterfield and it's, it doesn't matter. They're nameless, faceless opponents. It's about us. And I just didn't see that from the Huskers, which is disappointing. Um, you know, but Jessica, correct me if I'm wrong. I didn't feel like there was a lot of buzz about this game, yeah. like around Huskerville or around the state. And, and that's part of it too. You know, I can remember being part of big games where like, you felt like the state was a powder keg. Right, like you felt like it was just like one drop, and the place was going to erupt. And I didn't even feel that in the stadium pregame, you know. So I think there's a lot of factors to it. I mean, it's a decade of not winning those big games, not knowing what that feeling's like, not knowing how to do that as a fan, as a player, and and whatnot. But that's still no excuse because at the end of the day, you're a competitor, and if you're a competitor, you want to go toe to toe with the best. You want to say, hey, I want my shot at the best to show that I can compete with these dudes. And no one really stepped up to the table, offense, defense, special teams. You know, it, it was a true, it was a true butt kicking, right? I mean, it was a true butt kicking. And sometimes you need those as players to kind of be like, man, that's where we want to be. And we're really far off. So I better work harder. So, you know, Coach, I think it was Coach, oh, I think it was Coach White that brought up, you know, they're playing not to lose. And we've heard that from Coach Roll before. Mm -hmm. But as a player, how do you work through that? I mean, I know that there's a lot of players on this team that are new, but there are a lot of players that have, unfortunately, been on the wrong side of the scoreboard um, more times than they would have liked during their career as a Husker. And so, you know, to, to work through that mindset, and, you know, I know probably you're going to say it takes winning, but then it's like the chicken and the egg. you got to win to get there, but you got to work through that mindset to get that win. So how do you work through that? You just got to keep winning. Mm -hmm. And I know that's not the answer people want to hear, but, you know, losers find a way to lose and winners find a way to win. And when you're on a team that knows how to win, when you get in those pressure situations, and those critical situations that we talk about, I talk about a lot on this show, you know, you really start to either rise to the occasion or you fall back on what you're comfortable with. You fall back on your training. And, you know, when you're used to winning, it's really be like, hey, we've been here before. We can handle this. Let's go out and do our thing. But when you're used to losing, you think, man, I got to do something different, right? Like I got to change. I got to play harder. I got to try and push or I got to try and press and make the big play or do whatever it is. And sometimes you can kind of get yourself out of whack. And when you play on high emotion, you try and rise to the occasion instead of just staying steady, things really can fall apart quickly. And so I think guys playing not to lose doesn't mean that they're out there scared, Right? Yeah. I think that's a, that's a notion of like, oh, these guys are playing not to lose. They're scared. Playing not to lose just means you're trying to do something different that you're not maybe used to doing. And that's when you see like quarterbacks press the ball and like, I got to make that throw deep, even though it's a, a double coverage. Or the running back says, man, I got to spark this offense and try and bounce this inside run play to try and create an explosive play. Or on the defensive side, maybe it's, hey, I know if I'm supposed to be in this gap, but I, I think I can beat this guy on the inside and, and get a sack and spark us, and all of a sudden it's a crease through your gap for a long run, right? Those are what playing not to lose looks like, is trying to do things too much and play out of the system. Instead of just trusting the system, trusting what you're supposed to do, and being able just to let the big plays come as they go. And, you know, this game got a, away from us really quickly, and so I think a lot of guys were pressing trying to make something happen instead of just stay in the course, trusting the system and letting things play out. It's amazing that you said that because that's almost exactly what I kept hearing in those position huddles, especially from Terrence Knight and the defensive line started trying to do too much and then yep. play started breaking down and then that's when it snowballed a couple of drives because I, I think it was exactly that. I mean, guys weren't doing their job and that's what Terrence Knight was saying. He was do your job and not anything more, not anything less and that's so important and sometimes it can be so hard to remember in that kind of moment when it is getting out of hand in a hurry. Yeah, especially when you're looked at as a leader, as a veteran, right? You're like, I have to be the guy, right? Instead of letting the big play come, you create it on your own. And when you go rogue and you go AWOL, big plays happen, right? Especially when you're playing against a really good front. You know, hats off to Michigan O-line. There's five of those dudes that may get drafted. All five of those starters may get drafted on the front. Yeah. You know, I had multiple people, I have a group chat, and one of my buddies is like, why can't Nebraska be like Michigan and just run this simple offense? I was like, well, 
when you have great talent, you can be very simple. Yeah. Right? When you know you can just line up and play bully ball, like, hey, my guys are stronger and bigger than yours, so you know what we're doing, but good luck stopping it. Yeah. That's, the, that's what everyone wants to do. Everyone would love to be the simplest offense of all time, right? <laughs> hey, we're going to line up, we're going to run dive, and then we're going to run counter, and then we're going to run dive, and then we're going to play action and throw it over your head. There isn't an offensive coordinator in the country that wouldn't say, hey, yeah, sign me up for that if that means we're going to win a lot of games. But when you're outclassed talent-wise, and I don't think anyone who will dispute that Michigan was the more talented team, you have to try and scheme some things open or scheme some big runs and scheme things with motions and trying to get guys out of gaps and moving and slanting. And when you have that kind of offense and that kind of defense, all 11 guys have to execute that job perfectly or else it breaks down very quickly. Mm. And we saw that happen on offense and defense this week against Michigan. I mean, guys were trying to press and make something happen. All it takes is one guy out of his gap, and there goes Blake Corum running through the A-gap untouched for a 12-yard gain, right? Or on the other side, it's like, hey, trust it, stay in there running back, push it and get four. And he's like, ah, I got to get 15 and bounces it to the unblocked corner. And now it's a loss of two, right? So it's a lot of stuff like that that just happens through the ebb and flow of a game. But when things spiral like that, it's really hard as a player just be like, just stay focused, stay trusted, like just do what you're supposed to do because you want to be the guy that tries to fix everything. Heinrich Harburg told me after the game, I, I talked with him and um, his third start and he told me, he's like, you know, honestly, I'll learn the most from this one. I'll take the most away from this one. And, and you know, he wasn't happy with how he played, said, I, I got to be better. And even Matt Rule said that, you know, we're going to challenge him. You got to continue to get better. But um, I guess what were your, your takeaways from Heinrich and his performance in his third start against Michigan? Yeah, well, you know, first of all, this was Heinrich's first look at a real defense. And I'm not poo pooing on the two teams that he played out of conference, but there's a drastic difference in speed, physicality, and just the, the pace of play when you're playing a Michigan versus a La Tech, right? Like, it's just one of those things that you can't replicate until you get in there. And so with a young quarterback who's making a, his first start against a Big Ten opponent and a college football playoff team, I kind of expected that from him, right? It's a learning curve. It's going to. And any time you play young players, there's a learning curve that comes with playing against upper-level talent. And so... He's definitely going to learn from that. I mean, that's probably the best defense he's going to face all year, right? So the fact that he got to see them early, I think is actually going to pay dividends for him as he moves forward if he is the starting quarterback because he's going to be able to see things now and be like, okay, I saw that on tape last week. I played against it against Michigan. How is Illinois going to do this? How is Purdue going to do this? Northwestern, blah, 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 down the line. You know, you can only learn from real live reps. And so I think he's just going to continue to grow and get better. And you've seen him get better from when his first start to even his third start. I know he didn't light the world on fire, you know, but he made some good decisions in this game. He made some bad decisions in this game. But overall, I think he's going to continue the type of player and the type of kid he is. He's going to learn, grow, and just keep getting better going forward. All right, so last night on Sports Nightly, we got a call that was asking about the tight ends. And it led to this discussion between Greg and me. He pulled up the stats, and the tight ends were um, – Targeted four times, Janiron Bonner once, Nate Borkutcher once, Thomas Fedoni twice, and all four resulted in catches. And we've seen Fedoni do a couple of, of really good things. We know what Nate Borkutcher can do. We've heard all these great things about Janiron Bonner. And again, I'm by no means an expert offensive coordinator by any means, but it, I said I would like to maybe see the tight ends more involved with this offense and, and maybe targeting them more. What, what's your take on that? Would you like to see the tight ends more involved? Oh, for sure. You know, tight ends are a great safety blanket for quarterbacks, right? When things break down and you got pressure in your face and things are going around, you want to look for your biggest body with the widest catch radius. And most usually that's the tight end, right? So getting them involved. And I also think Fedoni and Borkature specifically are really good with yards after the catch. So getting them balls quickly when they're matched up against a nickel or a safety and allowing them to either run that guy over or stiff arm. Fedoni and, and those guys can make those guys miss and then get another six, seven yards out of them before the cavalry arrives. I think it's going to be a big thing here, too. You know, those guys are doing a good job in the running game. I think they're doing a good job blocking um, for what they can do. You know, no one did a very good job blocking as <laughs> Michigan. Um, you know, but I think that getting those guys more involved in the RPO, the quick passing game, is definitely going to help with the confidence of whoever quarterback is. Family traditions mean great food, with treasured Italian family recipes passed down for generations. Valentino's has become Nebraska's classic Italian tradition for 65 years.
Let's talk Illinois. You've watched them on film too. What's been your takeaways from what you've seen out of Illinois? They had a tough one last week too. So if you're talking about confidence wise, well, Nebraska had a tough one last week. So did Illinois. Yeah, they're as much a dumpster fire as anyone right now. Um, you know, I <laughs> I think I sent you the clip. They had a their quarterback play is not very good. You know, they had a wide open touchdown and he overthrew him by like thirty yards. You know, but they've had to reshuffle their offensive line. They've had to move guys around. They're struggling on offense as much as we are to find an identity. You know, they lost Chase Brown to getting drafted by the Bengals last year, you know, so they lost their quarterback, Tommy DeVito. You know, so they, they lost some key pieces on that offense, and then you lose your D coordinator, and he takes four staff members with him over to Purdue. So they're ailing right now too, you know, and both teams are – are licking their wounds a little bit from last week. And so I think Illinois is going to come out and try and play bully ball again. You know, that's what Brett Bielma's DNA is, all, going all the way back to Wisconsin and when he was at Arkansas and, and all those things. So I think he's going to try and come out and really try and establish an identity in the run game with what he wants to be and how he wants to run the football with his offense. And, you know, as far as defensive goes, they've got two really solid interior defensive linemen that are NFL caliber you know, but on the back end is where they're susceptible to some big plays, and Purdue took advantage of that last week. So it's going to be an interesting matchup. You know, I think both teams are trying to get back on the right track. I think this is a pretty evenly matched game. You know, I think at beginning of the year, we kind of looked at this game like, well, Illinois is supposed to be really good, and they could be a, a really good contender and whatnot, but I think they're in the very similar boat that Nebraska is, is we, they, they lack identity on offense, and they're struggling to find big plays on defense. So um, that being said, Nebraska still leads the Big Ten in rushing offense, and Illinois is last in rushing yeah. defense. How much is this maybe a potential game to get things back going on the ground? Uh, Huskers really had a hard time running the football last week. Yeah, I mean, this is going to be a ground and pound game. I think this is going to be a very quick game because I think both teams are going to want to ground and pound and control the clock. and be physical. So I think we'll see a lot of quarterback run in this game with either Harburg or Sims, whoever gets the nod, a lot of carries for Anthony Grant, you know, a lot of carries for everyone's going to want to carry the football because it's going to need to be by committee. This is similar. Like I said, before the CU game, we're going to need to run the football 40 plus times in this game if we want to win. Right. And that means that you're going to need to get a lead, control the clock, be effective, be effective on first and second down, not putting yourself in third and longs, you no know, third and five and manageables. And so that means winning on first and second down on the ground. Greg asked me this last night. I'll ask you this because you'll you will be have a better answer than me, I'm sure. So <laughs> Maybe. you know the Huskers were really good at getting to the quarterback those those first three weeks, and then the last two have not had any sacks. Cam Linhart has been out the last two games and not putting everything on one guy. But how much do you think maybe that has contributed to the Huskers' um, lack of getting that getting those sacks and tackles for loss? Yeah, I mean, Cam Leonard's a guy that is a very good pass rusher. You know, Prince Well had a few really good rushes last week where he was one or two steps away from affecting the quarterback. You know, Nash Hutmecker is doing a really nice job pushing the pocket inside. But like I said last week, not surprising you didn't get any sacks because they had such a lead. They weren't really in any drop back situations. And I can only think of one or two third and longs that they were at, which, you know, as a coordinator, as a D coordinator, that's what you live for to dial up your blitzes. But, you know, we're really lacking that ability to have that guy just win his one-on-one -on -one matchup, which we saw Cam Lenhart do against Colorado multiple times. And so we would like to kind of find, is it Chief Borders, MJ Sermon, Ty Robinson, uh, Elijah Judy, you know, who's going to step up? Because we have to have someone that steps up to be able to put pressure on the quarterback without having to blitz. I think Luke Reimer, not being in the game, you know, he's such a big, important blitzer. He does such a nice job of winning his matchups against running backs when he's put on them in pass protection. Not having him in the game affected that as well. But a lot of it is, like I said, in Nebraska's offense, winning on first and second down. And I've said it over and over again, I'll continue to say it. You earn the right to rush the passer on defense by winning on first and second down. Yeah. Right? So you have to earn the right to rush the passer and get after the passer, which is what we did against Colorado. We had them in third and eights and third and elevens and whatnot. So... If we want to do that, we have to put Illinois in a situation where they need to be in a true drop back and routes got to develop down the field in order for them to push, which then allows us to have those blitzes, those slants, those stunts that have been so effective for us early in the year to get back going again and get fine back into that pass rushing rhythm.
You're not a fan of defensive backs, but you have been a little bit of a fan of Deshaun Singleton. Yes. How tough is that to lose him back there at safety? That was a tough one. You know, there was multiple times in that game where I think Singleton makes the right run fit and he gets up and instead of it being an eight, nine yard game, it's probably more of like a three or four yard gain, right? So, I mean, I think losing him and having him not out there is a big problem, not just in the pass game, but really more in the run fits. I know he had done a great job of run fitting in the box, knowing where his leverage was and, and really trusting his eyes and trusting his instincts and shooting gaps and, and making big tackles. So losing him early in that game hurt. Um, but you no, know, next man up. As, un, as unfair as that is to say, and as cruel as some people mm -hmm. might say that is, that is what football is. It's next man up mentality. You got to go in there. It's your opportunity. You got to make the most of it. Okay, so let, let's talk quarterbacks again. You know, this is conversation that continues to be ongoing as we await Jeff Sims to be fully healthy. Heinrich Harburg's played and started the last three games. How do you see this shaking out? Do you, you, you and I, I think both are in agreement that we think eventually, when he's healthy, we will see Jeff Sims again. Yeah, whether that's this week, next week, you know, I think Jeff Sims eventually will come back. You know, Harburg did very serviceable against two lesser opponents last week. He showed he was young, but I do think he's earned the right to continue to be on the field, and he's earned the right that Jeff Sims doesn't have a huge lead now in I am the starting quarterback. Right, like if he goes out there and fumbles the ball, throws a couple of interceptions, they're going to not even blink an eye putting Harburg back in the game. So I do think this is still Jeff Sims' team. I do think he is still the guy that will eventually take the reins back at QB1. But the great news is you have a very comparable, a very comp, you have a very comparable, comparable? quarterback, comparable quarterback to Jeff Sims in Harburg and the fact that the offense doesn't have to change regardless of which one of those two quarterbacks come into the game. Okay, so, I mean, and this is the million-dollar question, and I think if we knew the answer, this would be fixed, but in your, you know, outside perspective, what can this offense do to get going? They've just kind of sputtered at times, and, and while we've seen them wear teams down the, the two weeks that they got wins, they just really have struggled, and, and I know you talk about identity, but how do you, how do you fix that? How do you get, get some things going and get some consistency? You start fast. You know, I think so much of that is, is an early in the game, you need to come out and start fast, and you need to dictate the control of the game. You know, the killer for any team is if you get the ball first or even your first possession, and if you go three and out or you have a negative play early in the game, like, it really doesn't give the OC confidence to continue running the football. So as an offensive line, as a tight ends, quarterback, running back group, you want to give the offensive coordinator confidence and your ability to run the football early in the game by starting quickly, you know, being effective and efficient, four-yard runs, right? An efficient run for me when I'm grading the tape is a four-yard run. And we have not been very efficient, especially in the first down when running the football and giving ourselves second and six, right? We've been in a lot of second and eights, second and sevens. And for me, to get yourself on track, it comes with confidence, and it comes with starting quickly in the run game and giving a lot of guys confidence in our ability to run the football. So Coach Rule talked about how hard they went in practice on Sunday night right Ooh. after a really physical game. And it's a quick turnaround, obviously, with a Friday night game. And I know you haven't played for Coach Rule, but you have, I'm sure, been in those situations where coaching staff isn't <laughs> happy with the performance and then you have to get right back out there against, after a game like Michigan and have a full-on practice. What is that like? The only thing I have that's even remotely close to that is we played Iowa State in 2009, and we had more turnovers than points. <laughs> I think we turned the ball over eight times and only scored seven points and lost to Iowa State like 10 to 7 at home. Oh, my gosh. And Coach Bo, obviously not very happy. And on Monday, Monday morning, or Monday afternoon, we had a full padded practice. And the first hour of practice was nothing but ball security drills, which the offensive linemen also had to do. So we were doing the gauntlets and we were doing like the, the, the monkey drill where like you're jumping and rolling with the ball in your hands and then <laughs> rolled right into a full nine on seven inside run, like go and practice. And that was terrible. It was awful. But we got the message. Yeah. Right. We got the message, which was, listen, you guys don't want to go play around. You want to jerk around on Saturdays? Fine. We'll just work on during the week. Right. Like if you don't want to go out and work on Saturdays and play hard and play fast and play physical, we'll just we'll just work during the week then. And guess what? We never had to do that again, mm. right? And this is rule setting a culture and setting a tone that 
if it's not up to par, if it's not what I want it to be, we'll work during the week then, mm -hmm. right? You get, you get to earn the right to go play on Saturdays, but you earn it during the week. We used to know if we were going to win a football game by Friday, right? Was it a good week of practice? Did we execute? Are we confident? Yeah, we're going to go out and win this football game. And I've been part of teams where it's like, man, this was – wasn't a great week of practice. We're going to have to dig deep for this one. And sometimes we won, but a lot of times we didn't. You win the game during the week. And obviously whatever we did last week was not good enough for Coach Rule, so he's going to change it up and find a way to practice to make sure we win. Did you hold on to the football during those ball security gear no, drills? No, of course not. I had my <laughs> wrist tape. I had fingers taped. You've seen my finger. You think I can hold on to a football with that? Get out of here. I wear casts. I used to wear casts on my hands. And let, then you want me to jump around and, and, yeah, no, the offensive linemen were a disaster. <laughs> oh, my gosh, that's hilarious. All right, let's uh, – getting back on track. <laughs> getting back on track and, and back to Illinois. Three keys. Give me your three biggest keys for this one. By the way, you're going to be back on the call for this one. I should have mentioned am. that earlier. You'll, you'll be back yes. on the call with us. But your, your three biggest keys for Nebraska to get back in the win column against Illinois. Yeah, number one, we need to have 200-plus yards rushing in this game if we want to win this football game. We need to have it, and it doesn't have to be a 100-yard rusher. I don't care if it's a, a 200 by committee, right? I mean, whether that's a big reverse, whether that's whatever it is, 200 yards rushing on the ground, controlling the clock. On defense, we got to take the ball away. we got to take the ball, steal some possessions, give our offense that is struggling a short field. So getting a turnover is there. And then we're really going to need our special teams, right? This is going to be a three-phase game. So offense run the ball, defense take the ball away, special teams be special. Be special. Make something happen. Big punt return, make all your kicks, make sure if there's a, a, a kickoff call that's a, out of the end zone, it doesn't dribble short, or don't give Illinois any life on offense because they're struggling too. So special teams make them go the distance, flip the field, and just be special. Offense, defense, player to watch. I mean... <laughs> it's so hard to pick because it's like everyone's got to play better. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, I think offensively, I'm, I'm going to look to Marcus Washington this week. You know, we didn't talk about the receivers. He had the big catch to open the second half. He seems to be getting healthier, looks a little more explosive out of his breaks. I'd like to see him take the top off the defense and have a nice long touchdown to stretch some of those safeties and those DBs to understand, hey, we do have a down-the-field threat. So I'm going to go Marcus Washington on offense to watch. And on defense, I'm going to go with uh, Gifford. You know, I think with Singleton being nicked up and banged up, he's going to be the voice in the back end, and he's going to have to be that eraser that's flying over the field, making plays, making tackles, dropping into coverage. So he's going to have to have a big game this week. You know, for this team, every week the messaging has been 1-0 this week, and they have big 1-0s everywhere all around the facility with the logo of the team that they're playing. But for us on the outside and, and for, you know, the sake of this podcast and this discussion, how important are, is this game and the next three, you know, that are maybe potentially winnable games? I mean, when you're talking about building confidence, instilling a culture and continuing to, you know, figure out a way not to play like you were just talking about earlier, not to lose, but, but to have that mindset, we're going to win these football games. How important do these next four games become in your mind? Very important. And, you know, specifically because it's on the road, right? We need to win one on the road. Right, we we got to get a big win in conference on the road. You know, we beat Iowa last year on the road, but this year we haven't had a road win yet. When you build confidence, it's by winning in someone else's house. Mm -hmm. You walked into their house, said, this is now our house. We own you. We won here. That can give the team the most confidence in the world. It's great to win at home. Trust me, there's nothing better than winning in front of your own stands. But when you go on the road somewhere on a, on a Friday night, lights are on, you know, the world's watching because there's nothing else on TV unless you want to watch something stupid. <laughs> you know, you, you turn football on. And so a lot of eyes, a lot of question marks on both sides of the team here, and you want to come out of there going, we did it right, we prepared the right way, we beat a team on the road that's beat up on us the last couple of years, get some confidence for the long weekend heading back home. I love it. Well, how excited are you to be back on the call with us? Oh, I can't wait. You know, I had a ton of fun in CU in the first half, so let's, I'd like to call a full game. Uh, you know, have some fun there with Greg and Ben and you guys on the call. So excited to be back in Champaign. You know, I, that was my first call on the radio for the sideline in 2021. So 
Excited to be back in Champaign. It's going to be a little bit better booth than CU2, which helps because CU was an absolute poop hole. So excited <laughs> to be back in a, in a real football stadium booth. And we don't have to get on the bus at 445 in the morning. Yes, I won't start my pregame show when it's dark. <laughs> so that's very, very, very nice. All right, well, we're, look for, we're looking forward to it. You're gonna and it's Greg's know. birthday on Thursday. Yes, So we'll get is. to go out and do a little celebratory toast to old Greggy Sharp, the voice of the house. And you're going to be on Sports Nightly with us that night, too. So all, yes. all kinds of fun things happening Just, over these the next few days. So... Appreciate it. Glad you're back. Um, sad you didn't get an elk, but uh, we're excited to have you back on the call with us this weekend. Absolutely. Looking forward to it. Go Big Red. All right. For Jeremiah Searles, I'm Justin Goody. This has been the Sideline Slice presented by Valentino's Pizza, the official pizza of the Huskers.